familiar? I'm asking whether these look familiar because like, I'm not sitting in the lecture, so I don't want to be covering stuff that you haven't seen, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's look at the, uh, oh, they were in the homework example that you gave me anyway, so I know. What, what, is the, what do they do with the homework? Uh, I'm just seeing CHCL2, H2O. Oh, yeah, and some lithium. Yeah, lithium. Oh, yeah, you have a lot of homework problems here about this. Okay, so you need to know that. Okay. All right, the key thing about these is you should think of them as sources of H minus. These are sources of hydride. Sources of H minus. Notice these are not sources of H plus. These are not acids. They're not sources of H plus. They're sources of H minus. We haven't talked about H minus before in the course. Uh, so these are sources of H minus. Okay, so if we treat this aldehyde with sodium borohydride or lithium lunar hydride, we can get it back to the methanol. Okay, now something else we might want to do is uh, add more carbons to this. I want to add some more carbons to this, so let's see how that would work. So this is something that you guys have seen a lot of, right? Um, this is what's called a Grignard reagent. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Grignard. Yes. Let's Wait, see. Mm -hmm. So what do we want to do now? We want to get it back to the methanol? Yeah, except um, now we want to learn a way to get an alcohol with more carbons than this. So let's put this aside, actually, for a second and just learn about Grignards. Let's just learn about Grignards for a second, and then we'll come back to our table. Okay. Um, so let's think about what we can do with this grid yard here. Let's see if we can predict how this would behave. Um, well, would you consider this bond here to be covalent or ionic? Ionic. Why is that? Because metal and non-metal. Yeah, metal and non-metal. Now, actually, um, this metal is far enough to the right that oftentimes this is thought of as a covalent bond. This metal is uh, far enough to the right, this is often thought of as covalent. However, it's still most useful for purposes of synthesis to consider this ionic. For purposes of synthesis, it's best to consider this ionic. So how would we rewrite that? We would rewrite it. Right, let's. With a positive on the magnesium and a negative on the carbon. Um, most instructors actually prefer that you write Grignards like this. Again, I don't, I'm not sitting in any lecture, so I don't know for sure what your instructor would want. But uh, most instructors prefer to write Grignards like this. You have an example of a Grignard in here. Oh, he's not doing it that way. But uh, I, I think this would be fine. Okay. So it's simplest to rewrite a Grignard like this. Um, even though, in a sense, this is actually a covalent bond, we're going to treat it like ionic. By the way, that means you can't draw the dash anymore. You can draw it either this way or this way, but it would totally be wrong to draw it like this. You can't, you got to choose one or the other. And we're going to choose the ionic approach. All right, so anytime you see a Grignard, you want to rewrite it like this. Okay, now, um, these guys here are really just spectator ions. We're not going um, to worry about this. Just like sodium and potassium, right? We're not doing much with um, positive uh, metals. This is where the, what's going to be interesting to us over here. Does this look like a nucleophile or an electrophile? A nucleophile, because it's got a negative charge. And this should be very interesting to you, because what types of carbons have we seen so far? So far, all the carbons we've seen have been electrophiles. So this is the first time we've seen to have a carbon nucleophile. Um, so this guy can actually be a nucleophile and attack uh, electrophiles. So let's see a reaction that we could do with that. All right, so we would put this carbon at the tail. Oh, we have actually seen it one other time. 
Ah, very good. That's right. All right, I stand corrected. That's right. So you're right. We have seen a nucleophilic carbon. You're absolutely right. So we have seen a nucleophilic yes. carbon. Very good. Now, it turns out that that's not nearly as useful because all you can do with that is add a C and an N. That's not very flexible. It can only add a C and an N. Whereas this could have a whole long carbon chain on it. But that actually is a, is a good catch. I'm glad you thought of that. Okay. Um, so this is going to be our second and more useful carbon nucleophile. Okay. So um, this would be at the tail. Now, who would be reasonable to put at the head of an arrow here? Oxygen. Let's see why. You should use the charges. So we need to find an electrophile, right? Yeah, what are our principles for electrophiles? First of all, an electrophile should have a partial or a full positive charge. Well, this carbon has a partial charge. But more important, um, I think I might have mentioned to some of you before, um, in this course, electrophiles are almost always carbons. It's going to be very rare that you use an electrophile that's not a carbon. Almost all our electrophiles are going to be carbons here. Now we found a way that a carbon... are going to be slightly connected to the O, but not really. Uh, oh yeah, so you're getting ahead of us, but yeah, that's right. I think that's right. Okay, so we would put the arrow in like this. Okay, now this already has a full octet. So we have to kick these electrons off over here. Notice that this is um, almost like an SN2. It's not an SN2. It's like an SN2. If this was an SN2, the oxygen would leave. Instead of leaving, the pi bond is leaving. So instead of having the leaving group leaving, we're just having the pi bond leaving. But this all does happen simultaneously here. All right, yes, yeah, so let's see if we can draw the product of this. How does it attach if that carbon already has four bonds? Because the oxygen is leaving. Oh, oh. Yeah, so we have to break this bond. We have to break this pi bond over here. Uh, as usual, it might be helpful to number here. One, two, three, four, and five. Three, four, and five. All right, so we have the number two carbon. The number two carbon is going to end up bonded to the number four carbon. The number two carbon is going to end up bonded to the number four carbon, and the number four carbon is going to end up with only one bond to oxygen. Okay, good. All right, so numbering is very helpful here to make sure that you're attaching things at the right place. Make sure that your picture looks like this and you're not losing any carbons or dropping any carbons. Uh, and we have to think about the charges. This carbon's at the initial tail. It's losing electrons, so it should end up neutral. So this ends up neutral. This oxygen is at the final head. It starts neutral and it's gaining electrons, so it should have a negative charge. And I think somebody had already said, well, now the magnesium could counter this oxygen over here. So again, you can see, and the bromine just keeps going along for the ride. So very important, the bromine is not going to participate in any reactions here. This is not a free halogen. We're never going to do anything with the Mg or the Br. The Mg and the Br are Aren't just a chemical. Aren't Grenier's only Mg and lithium? Pardon? Aren't Grenier's only Mg and lithium? Yeah, actually lithium is not technically called a Grignard, but it behaves the same way. We can yeah. talk about that in a second. But yeah, the lithium reagents and the Mg Br reagents behave the same way. Uh, and in both cases, the metals are not going to participate. And this Br is just going to stay attached to the Mg. We're never going to do anything with that. That's totally a, just a spectator. Okay, so that gives us uh, this over here. Okay, um, and uh, now um, the next step would be um, to add something to protonate this oxygen. We could add, say, uh, some water or some acid to protonate this oxygen. At this so point. we get to pick what we add? Uh, well, usually you want to. Uh, usually, the reason that you would do this is to make an alcohol. Usually, uh, the reason you would do this is to make an alcohol. Um, so you would now add um, some water or some acid. Uh, different instructors write this different ways. A lot of times, the instructor would just write this as H3O plus at this point um, to protonate uh, this oxygen. So I'll call this H3O plus. Well, where do we get H3O plus from? You just add it to the beaker. Um, so you, you take you take some you take some um, water with acid in it. You take some water with acid in off your shelf and you put it in your reaction mixture. So okay. this would be a separate step. So yeah, this is something we would add secondly. So we should say this is step one, and this is the second step, step two. And at this point, you can just ignore the MGBR to just float off. 
into outer space. We don't care about that anymore. Uh, this would give us our final alcohol over here. Uh, Does okay. that say two H3O plus? It means step two, oh, H3O plus. Have you guys ever seen like number of reactions now where they're adding reagents in two separate steps? So that again should have been uh, some stuff. Do we have to draw how the H gets on there? You could draw the uh, mechanism. I skipped that for time reasons, but that would just be uh, the same type of reaction as we've seen uh, a couple of times here. Like that. the net, you take the electrons from the oxygen and put it on the H. So if we were going to draw the reaction, we would show it as yeah. like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's always good to, to draw in that step. 